Hey everybody, Ryan here. Alright, gonna go over all the games for tonight. The 19th of April, 2021. Now, if you don't know already, tonight is a special night. A big record was broken tonight, so make sure to stick around to the end of the video to find out what that was if you don't know already. Alright, like I always begin, if you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button. And make sure to hit that like button as well. Alright, let's get started with the games. Alright, first game was between Carolina and Tampa Bay. And Tampa Bay won this one 3-2 in overtime. In the first period, 14-42 into the first, Alex Kalorn, 12th goal of the year from Tyler Johnson and Anthony Sorelli. Then at 2.08 into the second period, Braden Point gets his 19th goal of the year on the power play from Andre Pallat and Victor Hedman. Then at 10.03 of the second, Carolina responds finally. Andrei Sveshnikov gets his 13th of the year on the power play from Dougie Hamilton. Then a minute eight into the third period, Brady Shea ties the game with his second goal of the game. 8-11 into the third, there was a fight. It was not a glorious fight by any stretch of the imagination, as you can tell by the combatants in this one. Jake Gardner versus Alex Kalorn. Now, Jake Gardner's punches were probably some of the weakest punches I've seen since Alexander Simmons slapped a man numerous times. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up Alexander Simmons slapping Mark Stahl. Yes, it did occur. And I know I've referenced it before, but out of embarrassing fights, that is probably the most embarrassing. And Jay Gardner's punches were pretty dang embarrassing. Yeah, but it was good on him. I, I give him respect. It, the punches were awful. I will say that, but I give him respect for standing up for his teammate because he fought Kalorn because Kalorn, massive hit on Martin Natchez, a big scorer for Carolina. So Jay Gardner did the right thing standing up for his teammate. It wasn't a dirty hit by any stretch. Gardner really left him out to dry with a pass that left him wide open for that type of a hit. It was not a headshot, at least from what I saw, it did not look like a headshot. It didn't look like a dirty hit. He just hit a guy that unfortunately was it was a suicide pass and it it just unfortunately led to Nechos leaving unfortunately I'm not sure if he came back or not but he did leave but no extra penalties uh, I don't know I don't think Gardner even got instigator maybe he did but good on him for standing up for his teammate and like I said Kalorn did nothing wrong with the hit it was not a dirty hit it was a clean hit in my opinion so Gardner should not have been in that puck where it was if he had been reading the play and honestly it took him a minute to re even realize that Nachos had been hit after he passed it to him <laughs> if you watch the video he's got his back to it. he turns around Nachos is on the ground and he's like oh I think I just fudged up I should go after somebody for this and he did so good on him just needs to work on uh, learning how to punch something alright shots on goal were 36-27 in favor of Tampa Face offs 52 48 in favor of Carolina. Power plays 1 for 3 for Carolina, 1 for 2 for Tampa. Penalty minutes 13 11, 13 for Tampa. Hits were 32 30 in favor of Tampa. Blocks 14 10 in favor, oh, yeah, in favor of Carolina. And giveaways were 4 to nothing. 4 for Tampa. No giveaways for Carolina. That's got to be exciting for the coach. And Rod Brendamar being a coach definitely would be excited about that being a defensive forward in his time. Morazic had 33 saves, 917 save percentage in the loss. And Vasilevsky, 25 saves, 926 save percentage in the victory. Did I go over the game? I did not go over the game winning goal. I'm sorry. Game winning goal was 250 in the overtime. Yanni Gord, 16th from Kalorn. That probably hurts more than anything else for Carolina. Sorry, I don't know how I forgot to go over that. Talking about the fight, probably. All right. Next up is Columbus versus Florida. Florida wins this one 4-2. There was a fight in this game too. 11-40 into the first. Frank Vetrano gets his 16th goal of the year. Now nah, I didn't get to catch this fight. I need to see if I can find that one. Uh, 59 seconds into the second period. Sam Bennett's 5th of the year. I believe that's his first goal as a Panther. I know he had assists before this. But I think he had, that's his first goal. He's actually looked fairly well offensively since he came over to Florida. And that's really I think what he needed. He needed more chances. He just wasn't going to get that with Calgary. But he got his fifth from Huberto and Anthony Duclair. Then at 12:27 of the second, 
I am unsure what Gavin Bayrather did, but Sam Bennett got an instigator in this, so Bayrather did something. I, I, I just, like I said, I have not caught the clip of this one yet. I, I need to tr see if I can find it, but as of right now, I haven't seen it. And he did something, because Sam Bennett, I don't think, usually goes after people for no reason. But he did in this one. So, Bayrather did something. But they fought, so that happened. Then at 13.22, just under a minute after that, Oliver Bjorkstrand gets the first Columbus goal of the game. His 15th from Atkinson and Jones. Then at 14.03 of the second, Ratko Gudis scores his second goal of the year, and second in a week, from Duclair and, For and Gustav Forsling. At 8.01 of the third, Zach Dalpy gets his second goal of the year for Columbus from Eric Robinson and Andrew Peake. That 18.30 of the third, Vetrano gets his second goal of the game, 17th of the year, from Wenberg and Hornquist, making it your final score of 4-2. Alright, Florida outshot Columbus 39-36. They beat him in the faceoff dot, 63-37. Both teams 0-2 on the power play. 31 penalty minutes to 21. Florida with 31. 25 hits each, blocks were 15-8 in favor of Florida, and giveaways 20-8. 20, 20 giveaways for Florida. Yikes. That's a terrible giveaway number. 8 is more acceptable, but under... Why am I drawing Blake House name? Tortorella. Under Tortorella, 8 is a god-awfully high number, I'm sure, in his opinion, and my opinion too. 0, like, Colum like Carolina had, that's preferable. Of course, the result is not preferable. Merzlikens had 35 saves, 921 save percentage for the loss. And Bobrovsky had 34 saves, 944 save percentage for the victory. Both goalies played really well in this game. Alright, Detroit versus Dallas. Dallas gets the much-needed two points, getting the 3-2 victory in shootout. 15.50 into the first, Rupe Hintz gets his 14th of the year on the power play from Miro Haskinen and John Kleinberg. I don't know if I said this before, but his has been really good of late. Like he, his numbers have been shooting up. He's been playing so well. He's had a very good year. I mean, considering he has an assist later, as you can see already, he's at 37 points on the year. I, I'm not sure if that's a career high, but it's got to be up there. All right, 7:45 into the second, Luke Glendening gets his fourth goal of the year from Evgeny Sveshnikov and Alex Biega. Then at 16, I'm sorry, 11:06 of the second, Jason Robertson takes the lead for Dallas again. His 13th of the year from Hintz and Haskinen. Then at 16.55 of the second, Glenn Denning gets his second goal of the period. Fifth of the year from Biega and Darren Helm. Sending us to the third period tied at two. No score in the third. No score in overtime either. Shootout. Dennis Garyanov gets a shootout winning goal. Giving Dallas the two points. Alright, shots on goal were 36-22 in favor of Dallas. Dallas beam on the face out dot as well, 57-43. Detroit was 0 for 1 on the power play. Dallas 1 for 2. Detroit 4 penalty minutes to 2. Hits were 18-15 in favor of Dallas. Blocks 17-12 in favor of Detroit. Giveaways 15-8, 15, 15 for Dallas. Tomas Grice, 34 saves, 944 save percentage and loss. And Kudobin, 20 saves, 909 save percentage for the victory. On to Chicago versus Nashville. Now these two are battling each other for that fourth spot in the Central Division. Let's see who can come out on top in this one. Ah, Nashville getting the two points. 5-2 to two victory over Chicago. 6-22 into the first. Matt Duchesne gets his fourth goal of the year. Yep. Seven million dollars and you got four goals. Yeah, that's great. Hey, at least the team's winning now, right? That's all that really matters. From Eric Halla and Matt Benning. Then at 15-14 of the first, Alex Debrinkin's 23rd of the year on the power play from Pius Su Sutter. Suter? Suter? Yeah, Suter. Pius Suter and Patrick Kane. Why do I always mix up Sutter and Suter? Dang it, their names are so close. 448 in the second, Callie Yarn Yarncrock's 12th from Michael Granlund and Luke Cunnan. Then at 5.39 of the second, Matthias Eckholm 6 from Ryan Johansson. At 11.52 of the second, David Kampf gets his first goal of the year from Adam Gaudet. First point as a Blackhawk for, for Gaudet. 
Unfortunately, it's an illuminating effort. 23 seconds into the third, Tanner Jinnot. I want to say how to say that name, or is it Jinnot? I'm going to say Jinnot. His second of the year from Ryan Ellis. Then at 41 seconds into the third, they scored two really fast goals in the third, as you can tell. Luke Cunning gets his fifth of the year from Greenland and Yarncroc, giving us our 5-2 final. Nashville with the two points, extending their lead over Chicago. Chicago outshot Nashville, actually, 32-30. Nashville beat him in the face out dot, 52-48. Power play is 1 for 5 on for Chicago, 0 for 5 for Nashville. 20 penalty minutes to 10, 20 for Nashville. Hits were 22-19 in favor of Chicago. Blocks 16-10 in favor of Nashville. Giveaways 12-9, Nashville with 12. Kevin Lankinen had 17 saves, 773 save percentage. Yikes. And Malcolm Subban, 6 saves, 1,000 save percentage. And Juicy Soros, 30 saves, 938 save percentage for the victory. On to Minnesota versus Arizona. Arizona fighting for their playoff life at this point on a terrible losing streak. I believe it's up to 4 or 5. I really need to fix that one. And it continues. 5 to 2. Minnesota wins this one. Let's see. 919 into the first. Kirill Kaprizov gets his 18th of the year on the power play from Nick Benino and Kevin Fiala. Then at 1428 of the first. Christian Fisher gets his first goal of the season. Now, I, I've seen Arizona and Anaheim play many games this year, and I feel like Fisher has been more present than a goal and five assists that he has this year. I don't know why he has such low numbers. I feel like he's been around a lot more than that. I don't know how it's that low, but it is. The stats don't lie. All right, 337 into the second. Jordan Greenway's sixth of the year from Marcus Foligno and Joel Erickson Eck. At 9.38 of the second, Marcus Johansson's sixth on the power play from Matt Dumba and Ryan Suter. See, when it's Ryan Suter, I get it right, but I can't say it right when it's Pius Suter for Chicago. I don't, I don't understand it. All right, minute 15 into the third, Alex Golagowski scores his third of the year from Jacob Chikrin and Clayton Keller, giving us a 3-2 score at that point. Close game, but it was too little too late. 6.20 into the third, Fiala gets his 15th from Carson Soucy and Ian Cole. Uh, 17.53, Jonas, Jonas Brodin gets his 6th of the year from Dumba and Bonino. Bonino with continuous point streak. 5-2, to two. Uh, Minnesota gets the 2 points. The shots were tied, 24 each. Arizona killed them in the face on dot, 68-32. Minnesota hurt him in the in the power play though. Two to three, two for three. Sorry, zero for one for Arizona. Penalty minutes were six to two. Arizona was six. Hits were 45-24 in favor of Arizona. Sheesh. Blocks fourteen ten in favor of Minnesota. Giveaways thirteen five. Nashville, not Nashville. God, Arizona with thirteen. Goalies, Talbot had 22 saves, 917 save percentage for the victory. And Darcy Kemper, 19 saves, 826 save percentage for the loss. On to the North matchup of Ottawa versus Calgary. Kachuk versus Kachuk. Let's see which one can outscore the other in this game. Alright, 950 in the first. Brady Kachuk gets this 15th from Josh Norris. 11.23 into the first, Elias Lindholm gets his 13th from Johnny Gaudreau and Mark Giordano. Then at 19.04 of the second, Connor Brown's 15th of the year shorthanded for Nick Paul. Then at 7.52 of the third, Josh Norris would score what would end up being the game-winning goal. His 13th on the power play from Eric Brandstrom and Tim Stutzla. At 10.47 of the third, Michael Stone's second from Michael Backlund. Oh, Michael and Michael. Then at 18.25 of the third, Connor Brown, 16th of the year, unassisted, sealing the deal, 4-2, Ottawa with the two points. Yay, they passed Anaheim, woohoo! 19.10 of the first, I forgot to mention, Josh Brown fought Be uh, Brett Ritchie. Ugh, hopefully it better, fared better than Juju Akaria did against Ritchie. I haven't seen that one either, unfortunately. Alright, Calgary outshot uh, Ottawa, 28-20. They beat him in the face on dot 58-42. Power play is 1 for 2 for 
Ottawa 0 for 4 for Calgary. Pundit minutes 13-9, Ottawa with 13. Hits were 23-15 in favor of Calgary. Blocks 14-12 in favor of Ottawa. And giveaways 18-9, 18 for Calgary. Matt Murray looking solid again. 26 saves, 929 save percentage, and Markstrom, 16 saves, 842 save percentage, continuing his shaky first season with Calgary. All right, on to Montreal versus Edmonton. Edmonton wins this one 4-1. to one. Eesh, Montreal is going on a losing streak at the wrong time of year. All right, they actually started the scoring in the second period, 646 in. Eric Stahl getting the goal, his sixth of the year from Corey Perry. Then at 10.49 of the third, Ethan Bear gets his first goal of the year. Yes, you read that right. I'm honestly surprised Ethan Bear took this long to get his first. But he did. From Connor McDavid and Jesse Pugliarvi. Then at 15.11 of, of the third, McDavid gets his 24th goal of the year unassisted. That would end up being the game winning goal. 17.37 into the third, Pugliarvi gets his 11th of the year from McDavid. That would be McDavid's 50th assist of the year. Our first guy to hit 50 assists this season. I'm not sure we're going to have another. Maybe Dry Seidel. That's probably, eh, I guess Patrick Kane possibly could, but that's about it. 1821 into the third, our fourth and final goal for Edmonton in the period. Devin Shore's fifth from Kyler Yamamoto and Chris Russell. Oh, well, Montreal looked good for the first two and a half periods. That just went downhill real damn quick. All right, shots on goal were 36 23 in favor of Edmonton. Edmonton won the faceoff dot 53-47. Montreal 0 for 2. Edmonton 0 for 4 on the power plays. Penalty minutes were 8 to 4. Montreal with 8 hits 39 to 28 in favor of Edmonton. Blocks 14-12 in favor of Edmonton and giveaways 15-11. Edmonton with 15. Jake Allen made 25 saves for 8.93 save percentage. Carey Price came in in relief for a 7 save 1,000 save percentage relief. He. All right, Smith had 22 saves, 957 save percentage in the victory. All right, this is the record-breaking game. I will get to it after I get to the scoring, though. San Jose versus Vegas. Vegas wins this one 3-2 in shootout. All right, 927 into the first. Nikolai Kanishov gets his second goal of the year for San Jose. Minute 22 into, I'm sorry, 29 seconds into the second period. San Jose takes a 2-0 lead. Noah Gregor gets his fourth of the, fourth goal of the year unassisted. At minute 22, so just under a minute later, Mark Stone gets his 16th of the year on the power play from Shea Theodore and Max Pacioretty. At 3.29 of the third, Stone would tie the game with his second goal of the game, 17th of the year on the power play from Pacioretty and Theodore. Then the shootout winning goal would go to Alex Tuck. And so let's talk about this record-breaking game. Or, you know what? Actually, let's get through the stats first, and then I'll come back to it. Shots on goal were 40-31 in favor of Vegas. Vegas won the faceoff dot, 52-48. San Jose 0-2 for 2 on the power play. Vegas 2-5. for 5. Penalty minutes 10-4. 10 for... Uh, oh, God, I almost said Anaheim. San Jose... Hits were 30-26 in favor of San Jose. Blocks 22-16 to in favor of Vegas. And giveaways 3 each. Martin Jones 38 saves, 950 save percentage. And Leonard 29 saves, 935 save percentage for the victory. Alright, now on to that record breaking game. This was Patrick Marleau's 1,768th game of his career. Passing Gordy Howe for the sole possession of first all time in games played. Now, to some people, they say, oh, games played, who cares? Actually, it's a big deal. It was one of the last records that Gordie Howe actually had in this league. I think he still has a few others. Contrary to popular belief, he does not hold the record for most Gordie Howe hat tricks, even though they were named after him. I believe technically he only ever had one in his career. But, anyways, none of it demeans Gordie Howe. The, he was the greatest one of the greatest players to have ever played this game patrick marlowe is one of them too and you know what 1768 games not many people if any have ever even come close to that number that is a ridiculous amount of games played and you know what i remember i, I grew up with season tickets to the san jose sharks i remember going to 
games in the Cow Palace their first season in the league. Of course, Milo didn't play that year. I, I understand that. But uh, I, I've always gone to San Jose Sharks games. It wasn't until I moved up to Northern California in 20, 2005 when I really stopped going. And I still go back every so often and go to games. I don't go nearly as many as I used to. But we used to go to every game. And I do remember seeing Patrick Marleau's first game in San Jose. And my God, the man does not age. I mean, unless he has a beard, he looks the exact freaking same almost. I mean, maybe a couple of gray hairs in the, in the eyebrows, that's about it. But he definitely has the gray beard if he grows that out. That's when you see him aged. But I, I remember when he couldn't even grow a beard. I mean, the guy, great, one of the greatest players of all time. I mean, it, it's unfortunate he has never got a Stanley Cup. He, he definitely deserves it. And honestly, if San Jose were to get in the playoffs, I would be afraid to play them for that reason. It's just like I'd be afraid to play against Toronto in the playoffs because, yeah, they look dysfunctional right now, but they've got a few guys like Thornton and Simmons who have never won one. And those are teams I've always looked at when it comes to the playoffs and said, God, I don't want to play against them. They have something that they really need to play for. It's like Colorado that year that they won for Ray Bork. Would they have won if Ray Bork was on was not on that team? No. The amount of injuries they had in that playoff run? God, no. I mean, for God's sake, they lost Forsberg in, what, the second or third round with his uh, spleen being ruptured from a hit? I think we can accept them missing the games for that, but they didn't have him through the entire finals. That's one of their best offensive players. And they lost numerous others, including defenders and such. And, I mean, when you got a guy like that, I'd be afraid to play him. I really would. But I, I, I don't think he's going to get that chance this year. I really don't. I, I sounds like might be able to sneak in, but I'm just not sure they could beat the likes of Vegas and Colorado. I mean, that's a tough division for the top teams to play against. But... It's been a great career for him. I don't know if he's going to play out there this year. He may, he may not. I mean, this is his lowest point total of his entire career. Even in lockout shortened years, had never been this low. So I'm not sure that he has that that ability to keep up with the game anymore. So I'm not sure if he'll play again. But he may still be a good fourth line player for sure. But congratulations to him and thank you to Vegas for being very classy with it. Because you know what? They could have easily gone, oh, that's that's a San Jose Shark player. They're our main opponent, our main rivalry, so we aren't going to celebrate one of their players. No, they, they celebrated him. They first whistle after he touched the ice because he started on the ice. They stopped playing. They played a special video of Gary Bettman talking, and it got a bit wordy, Bettman. Come on. But still, it was very kind of him to do. No matter what, it was very kind, even if it did get wordy. I mean, the entire Vegas bench and the entire Sharks bench stood up, tapped the ice, tapped the, bo the boards. They all celebrated. It was great to see. All the Vegas players shook its hand. They immediately rushed uh, Marlo into the back after that because I believe they took his skates, gloves, and stick to the Hall of Fame. I think those are what they took. They at least took his gloves, if not his skates, too. I think that's what they usually do. But all the Vegas fans were standing for and clapping their hands for him. So, oops, sorry, I hit the mic there. Swinging my hands around like a crazy person here. But uh, everybody was celebrating. And you know what? That's the type of sportsmanship I expect from hockey. Uh, that's not the type of thing you see in many of the other sports. And that's why I like hockey, because they do that sort of stuff. These two teams can hate each other all they want. And that's fine. That's fun to see on the ice. But when something like this happens, they all stop that sort of crap and they all celebrate with each other. Because you know what? Fudge rivalry when it comes to something like this. That It was very classy for Vegas. I thank you. I send a thank you to them. And you know what? Even Marlo said thank you to him. You can see if you watch the video of it, you see him say hey, thank you to them. He really does. And you know what? Congrats to him. I know when they had their first game back in San Jose, I think, in a couple days. I think they had one more in Vegas, and then they go back home, I think. I could be wrong. I'm not sure of the schedule anymore. But, you know, it would have been great to have seen him do it in San Jose, break that record. But, you know what? 
is broken, that's all that matters. He can just go about finishing the season now. And also, next game they play against Vegas will be his 900th consecutive game played. So, there's that to look forward to next game too. So, it's a lot of celebrating for Marlowe at this point. And you know what? Out of his 1,768 games that he's played, 1,596 of those are with San Jose. That's a lot of loyalty there. And I mean, the only reason he left for Toronto those like four or five years ago was because San Jose said they weren't going to sign him. They didn't have the cap space, so they couldn't do it. And you know what? He went and he played, and he made more friends where he went. I mean, he seems like he's a very likable guy. So congrats to him. And you know what? It, we may be seeing his last game soon, and that's unfortunate, but it's just a cycle that we go through. The greats come and go. New ones come in, and we'll have to see who there's another Patrick Marlowe out there. All right. Sorry. Sentimentality there. You know what? I, I've seen this guy play since his first game, and that's not going to change. I'm going to see his last game, too. So, congrats, Patty. Hopefully, you can hit 2,000. I doubt it, but hopefully, you can. All right. That's it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Comment. Share. Let me know in the comments what you think of that record. You know what? Even if you don't like it, just say congratulations. You know what? I don't want to hear people talking about it's a nothing thing. I don't care what your opinion is on that. Just say congratulations because you know what? It's not every day we see a record of Gordy Howe's broken. Come on. Give us some respect where respect is due. All right. I will see you all next video. Bye, everybody.